Thank you, Simon. I think we'll now move to the uh, panel discussion session. Is that uh, correct, Dr. Strauss? Yes, OK. Um, so I think during this session, uh, the speakers uh, will take panel uh, questions from the panel members here. Um, does anybody want to start? Kathy Cho. I have a question for you, Ronnie. Can you comment a little bit on how compelling the data are for um, the P53 signature sort of progressing to stick? Uh, I guess my question is how many of them have actually been sequenced to show that there is a P53 gene mutation there? And do you think in some cases some of these signatures that we see may actually be physiological? You know, there's a DNA damage and the cells are responding to DNA damage, and that's why both P53 and gamma H2AX are up. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think there's a, a few points that suggest there's a lot more work to be done. So the first is that P53 being this early event, right? We see it in all these, uh, in all these tumors. Um, clearly, it's not enough because we can see signatures that don't uh, progress to invasive or even in situ disease. So what the biology of P53 mutations are in these cells remains to be defined, but there's ongoing work there. Uh, in the studies that we've done at the Brigham, where we've done sequencing, the vast majority of them do have a mutation. Um, and like as I mentioned, in those where there is uh, concurrent stick and invasive cancer, the mutation is shared. Um, but I think that there are, there are not many studies that have actually sequenced SIGs. Most of them have sequenced sticks, and in the sticks, we see similar mutations in the invasive cancer. Um, I mean, my personal opinion is that given that we see SIGs in a, in a majority, well, a third of all women at any given time suggests to me that that's consistent with what you might imagine a precursor or precancerous lesion to be because a lot of times, you know, you look in, in other cancers, uh, cervical, colon, you know, they're, they're common, but they don't amount to anything and they oftentimes go away on their own, right? And that's sort of the classic definition of what, what a precancer might be. Um, and I think this may be that given the genetic linkage between them, but I don't think we have tremendous numbers to say that uh, SIGs always have it. I would, I, I think the reason we don't have it is because most people haven't looked, right? So we do staining and that's easy. But most people haven't gone the extra step. And the other problem is that SIGs are very small. And so to capture, you know, 12, 20, 30 consecutive cells and get enough DNA to sequence is kind of challenging. Uh, in work that's not published, so we're, we're working now with Victor Velkulescu at Hopkins. We've actually been able to um, Sequence from normal epithelium, SIG, stick, invasive cancer, metastatic lesions in about five or six patients for which we have about over 40 samples. And again, there it's, this is whole genome sequencing. So he figured out a way to do it, which is pretty much of a technical tour de force, um, that P53 is in fact the earliest lesion and it is the trunk lesion for the, for the disease. And you can see it in every other derivative of that as you progress into invasive cancer. How many um, SIGs have actually had the sequencing done that were not in the setting of STIC and HCSC, that they were just isolated SIGs? Because that's sort of, I'm trying to understand, like, are they all P53 mutant or not, even before they've gone on? Yeah, that's a good question. I want to say about 50, roughly, mm -hmm. but, um, but not all of those are in isolation. So I'd have to go back and look and see exactly how many of them were, were just on their own. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, um, Alex, I'm wondering if you could uh, perhaps comment on um, what are some of the properties that would constitute a stem cell niche? Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Too much technology. Uh, uh, well, um, b basically, uh, niche is um, assembly of cells consisting of stem cells, uh, progenitor cells, and more differentiated progeny, as well as surrounding mesenchymal cells, um, vascular cells, and so on. So when we speak about niche, uh, it is a kind of not very precise uh, definition because uh, it may indicate that we really don't know for sure to start with, right? And so uh, this is one of the challenge uh, in general in stem cell biology. Very often you see publications, people write stem slash progenitor cell. Because again, to establish that this is a true stem cell which has self-renewal capacity plus ability to differentiate, uh, very often is very, very difficult. 
we, we can go with quite good approximation to that, but not completely. So a niche may indicate that inside of this niche, uh, you will have, for example, cancer-prone stem cells, but you may as well have a more differentiated or more committed uh, cell, which is also able to be cancer-prone. And then actually, in some cases, uh, it has been shown that in order to uh, have transformed phenotype, cells uh, have to, to uh, basically um, come out from stem cell stage and become uh, initially committed. Only after that, transforming mutations start to have effect on the biology and behavior of the cells. I hope it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Alex, just to follow up on that, uh -huh. um, you, as you discuss the bi properties of stem cells, they can go along multiple lineages. And do you believe these, are the stem, these stem cells are the same that go into the various histologic subtypes of epithelial ovarian cancer? Are these same, same hilar stem cells or at the junctions ones that lead to endometrioid clear cell as well as serous carcinomas? Um, uh, this is one of the possibilities. Uh, so ovarian surface epithelium stem cells are probably not the most um, actually um, represented type of cells because ovarian surface epithelium so far is not known to have several different differentiated cell types. So actually tubal epithelium is a bit more exciting because you have at least secretory and ciliated cells. So there you really can actually, that's one of the questions which definitely need to be addressed, uh, whether it is single stem cell or there are two different uh, stem cells giving two different lineages. Um, uh, so basically when we speak about uh, stem cells, we kind of presume that they have higher plasticity which allows them to uh, progress towards different type of differentiation. And so this may uh, be explaining why you have sometimes endometrioid uh, type of uh, cancer, sometimes you have clear cell, and sometimes you have serous ones. So this may be depends simply on genetic assembly. Or it may be uh, alternative way is really different stage of differentiation. So unfortunately, at this moment, I wouldn't be able to answer precisely. So we don't have any experimental data to say what my because I'm, I'm just thinking about mm -hmm. Simon's talk about some of the uh, epidemiologic risk factors. Do we have any data of what factors might be driving the stem cells to differentiate along various histologic subtypes? Uh, so, uh, so far, um, um, our experience and uh, you know experience of a number of people in this room, uh, uh, like uh, uh, cases. Uh, uh, shown that if you inactivate P53 and RB, it is most likely serous carcinomas. If you inactivate P10, it is most, it is endometrioid type of uh, carcinomas. Uh, whether it is really re related to different stage of stem cell, uh, basically uh, differentiation of cells, this is unknown. So we understand some of the genetic pathways as you've mm -hmm. outlined, but are there any experimental factors you can introduce that lead to those phenotypes or genotypes? Uh, so at, at, th at this moment, we know that genetically, uh, you can induce different type of tumors using different type of uh, genetic alterations. Whether it's additionally affected by some other factors, it's a very good question, and it's, at this moment, it's not really known. Yeah, just um, to follow up on, the, on those questions, you talked about cancer-prone stem cells. Um, do you have a way of separating stem cells that are destined to become cancer-prone versus those that are not? Do you have subsets uh, of these stem cells? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, would, I, I would wish to. <laughs> we, we are still not uh, at uh, this level of refinement. What we really know is uh, that uh, cell pool containing stem cells uh, is more susceptible to malignant transformation after inactivation of P53 and RB. So uh, obviously uh, there is now a lot of activity trying to see if other genes will have the same effect preferentially on stem cells as compared to more differentiated cells. What we know is that if you have differentiated cells without stem cells, you will start to have tumors which are slowly growing, if growing at all, and they have a really different phenotype. And so, uh, but, but you have perfect question because it may be that there are some uh, stem cells, particularly we suspect that there is more than one stem cell pool 
So what we identified it is great, and probably it is main pool involved in um, the daily, so to speak, regeneration. Uh, but um, uh, as we know from other organs and tissues, if you deplete those cells, for example, by killing them with diphtheria toxin or something, some other ablation method, you uh, start to observe uh, that those cells are quite easily substituted by other cells which are serving as a reserve stem cell pool. It's very difficult to kill mouse this way because it's immediately start to replenish uh, cells from somewhere else. And, and I wouldn't be surprised that, for example, if you speak about uh, a different type of regeneration situation, when there is not enough of uh, regularly present stem cells, you may have that pool, and maybe that pool has different susceptibility to tra transformation, which is additionally extra level of complexity. Mm -hmm. Alex, just to extend that a bit further, um, you know, a lot of the data or a lot of what's been presented is in the context of tumor initiation uh, with regard to stem cells. In your opinion, to what extent are stem cells then relevant for tumor maintenance or progression steps beyond the initial uh, events? That's the wrong button. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, uh, very good uh, question. So I, I would argue that probably for the uh, tumor progression, uh, again, I mean, it depends what you mean. It can be early progression where stem cells probably still uh, play some role more. Uh, if you have advanced uh, progression like metastasis or intraperitoneal spreading, I would probably expect that uh, it's maybe more important uh, to know mechanisms which are consistent with stem cell properties uh, rather than normal stem cells. Uh, but still, um, you know, I, I, I belong to the school which uh, thinks that there are not too many unique, cancer-unique mechanisms. Most of them are likely to be aberration of normal ones. And so to understand these mechanisms, you really need to understand normal stem cell biology before you start to uh, think about how to not simply treat cancer but to cure it. And so um, in, in this case, in, in terms of advanced stages of ovarian cancer, I would rather argue that if we understand uh, normal biological mechanisms involved, for example, in uh, regeneration, uh, this may give you some very good hints how to treat advanced stages of cancer. Yeah, I was just going to touch on Beth's point about experimental evidence for um, other alterations possibly giving you know, yield to the different subtypes. So there is a paper from uh, Jing Sung Liu's group in Texas where this is in vitro, but they isolated fallopian tube cells like we did, and then instead of utilizing P53 and BRCA and some of the other sort of more serious related genetic alterations, they introduced KRAS and got a mucinous carcinoma. So there's plasticity, I think, in the tubal epithelial cell, right, whether it's the stem cell or some derivative of it, that if it's hit with the right alterations that may be genetically defined, because we know from the TCJ there, there's a variety of different things that are unique to each subtype, may give rise to that. And there are, you know, sort of case reports that have been published of endometrioid sticks and mucinous sticks and even low-grade low serous cancers in the fallopian tube um, that can emerge there. So there may be something about that cell or that environment which is plastic enough to give you rise to different subtypes. Can, can I follow up on, on that question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so with other subtypes and, and some of the experimental evidence, for example, ADCRE injection and, and where you can actually follow transformation of the ovarian surface epithelium, of course there's caveats in terms of leakage and so forth. Can you comment on that? So you're talking about the OSC-based yeah, model? Yeah. I mean, the most recent one, uh, Terry Van Dyke had published uh, the Swoboda paper in Cancer Research where they use similar sort of approaches to target the OSC. Um, and, and a lot of the early models, you know, got cancers that look or had a serous phenotype to it. But I think as we've learned more about the sort of lineage markers of this disease, for instance, PAX-8, right, has been shown to be retained in 99% of all these high-grade tumors, a lot of these OSC-based models don't express PAX-8. And so it kind of brings into question, you know, what does that mean? Um, do we hit the wrong cell? Is it not the right lineage? Is it the, sort of the necessary stem factor? Or is it simply that you're just not targeting the tube and that's really what is going to give you a Pax-8 positive high-grade serous cancer? Um, may, may I uh, interject here? Um, I'm not completely sure with a statement about a lack of Pax-8 in uh, those tumors. 
uh, to my knowledge, many of them actually have paxate expression. But what is even more important that even inclusion cysts in the human ovary very often start to have Pax8 expression. And so uh, this is a nice marker, but it's again just a marker of uh, tumors derived from, uh, you know, this Mullerian type of origin of tissue. Uh, it doesn't itself indicate whether it is secretary origin or anything else. It simply just indicates that this is probably a feature of early stages of uh, cancer. So um, again, so, some I agree, I mean, some uh, tumors do not actually. Those tumors which were observed uh, coming from differentiated cells in our experiments, uh, they usually have low levels of Pax8 expression. But those which coming from stem cells, they do, so it's... Um, yeah, I just think that if you look at the data of over 1,500 tumor types where 99% of the high-grade series express Pax8, that's human data, which is what we base all our work on, it's, it, it's a marker. Um, and more importantly, if you look at the knockout mouse, where you knock out Pax8, the knockout of, of Pax8 in the mouse actually leads to agenesis of the female reproductive tract. The ovaries are completely fine. So that says Pax8 is important not only for the development of the Mullerian system, but it's also retaining the adult cell in 99% of these tumors, which I find fascinating because if you look at the TCJ, and Doug can speak to this, right, it is the most complicated genomic terrain of any other cancer so far described if you do a pan cancer analysis. And yet it holds on to two things it holds on to mutant P53 and it holds on to Pax8, right? So it suggests that those are critical. And in RNAi studies that were done by Bill Hahn's group, he showed that whole genome RNAi screens identify Pax8 as the most the highest ranking lineage marker for high-grade serous ovarian carcinomas. So I think from the human perspective, um, it clearly is a marker of these cancers. And cancers that don't express it, you know, either they've de-differentiated or I'd argue you haven't hit the right cell. Okay, question from Shelley, and then we'll have Simon respond. So um, other diseases where there's known preclinical lesions, such as colon cancer, they've been able to identify risk factors for the precursor lesion risk factors of the precursor lesion that are more likely or factors measured in the precursor lesion that are more likely to progress to cancer, um, and then uh, risk factors from progression of the precursor lesion to cancer. Is there, it's going to be very difficult in ovarian cancer to assess this because we can't just go find the lesions easily. How do you, do you have any ideas or thoughts about how we might be able to try to better understand what factors may predispose a woman um, to have these lesions and to have them progress? I'll take a stab at that, but um, so you probably are more familiar with this stuff than I am because you've actually been working with Chris on this, but um, you know, it, what leads to the development of these lesions is an area of a lot of debate, right? So Fathala's hypothesis of incessant ovulation, which was described in 1971, and I think has been reproduced over and over, suggests that, you know, unrelenting ovulation, so ovulation without interruption, or contraception, birth control, breastfeeding, all the things that block ovulation, reduce your risk of ovarian cancer, whereas incessant ovulation is associated with higher risk. You know, what's the biochemical or molecular equivalent to explain that is something that I think we don't know and need to study, right? There's ideas that ovulation and the release of the follicular fluid in the egg every month causes local damage to the surrounding cells, whether it's the stem cells or the tubal cells or the surface cells. But you know, how to really study that is something I think we really need to understand because it speaks to the sort of susceptibility of the tubal or mullerian epithelium to transform in ways that we still don't understand even the earliest thing. Why do we get P53 mutations so early on? Because as you mentioned, colon cancer has P53 mutations, but it happens much later in the sequence of events than it does in this particular disease, right? And why is that? Why is it that these lesions are limited to the fimbriated end of the tube, right, where it's at the interface of the ovary, but we see it nowhere else, right? These are factors that there's strong epidemiologic data that says that ovulation is linked, but what's the link to that? What's the biochemical, you know, assay that we can look to try to understand that? And why is it the secretory cell is, is the one that's susceptible? Yeah, I mean, just a, a few comments from listening to all of that. Um, so uh, I think that one of the comments that was made during your talk, Ronnie, was the seed and soil hypothesis um, ovarian, the ovary being a sink um, for many of these precursor lesions. And I think that is something that um, we, need, we shouldn't really overlook. I mean, for example, we know that clear cell ovarian cancer uh, arises from endometriosis that implants itself onto the surface of the ovary. We know that inclusion cysts are Pax8 positive. 
you know, there are also studies that do show that ovarian surface epithelial cells um, have paxate staining. Um, we know when we start to look more intricately at the um, regulatory profile of fallopian tube secretory cells, ovarian surface epithelial cells, that they have many similarities. Um, and I, I'm really impressed with the way there's so much more intensity in the analysis of these stem cell, these precursor lesions, these potential markers to understand that early stage etiology. But I wonder whether we need to extend that to looking at some of the other components of the ovary, um, the granulosa cells, the uh, the, the, the stem, not just the stem cell niches, but also the stromal uh, components and the, the interaction. Because certainly when we think of this from a genetic point of view, we also think about the genes and the genetic variants that are driving stromal um, uh, cell cell interaction with many of these, uh, these markers and these cell types. I agree. I mean, I think that there's clearly data from our group and others that says that there's something about the ovary. There's a lot of emerging work in cancer-associated fibroblasts and, and associated sort of microenvironmental factors that obviously contribute to the, you know, taking a precursor and making it a cancer that is not simply epithelial driven, right? So I agree 100% that those are, we need to develop the model systems to do that. I mean, there, there are folks that are trying to do that, to model more than just the epithelial compartment. Ernst Lengel at, at Chicago is doing nice work in that area, among others. Uh, you guys have done some work on that. So I think it's absolutely essential to, to really understand what, how it is that these lesions occur and how does the microenvironment sort of take that and either restrain it or enable it to develop into an early cancer, which is things that we still don't know. I just said. I'm trying to reconcile the stem cell and the, your work, Ronnie, and just kind of wondered if you've done, either in your clinical data or your preclinical models have looked at the stick lesions or even P53 lesions and, and looked at are there heterogeneous populations where some have stem cell type properties and others don't? We haven't really looked too much at stem cells. I'll tell you what I know from the literature. Um, well, first, I think the tubal perineal junction concept that Seiden has proposed. I think it's just a more specific region to look at this, right? He's sort of measured millimeters of how close it is to the tubal. And that's, that's, I'm fine with that. I don't, it's still in the fimbria, right? So these lesions are still emerging uniquely in the fimbriated end. Um, there are studies that have looked at labor retention, which Alex nicely described, and, and they're imperfect because the lineage tracing studies are better, but I've suggested if you use the uh, histone 2B GFP model, you see labor retaining cells in the distal end of the fallopian tube in a mouse. Uh, people have done some immunohistochemical chemical studies that were published in the last couple of years, looking at your, your typical stem cell marker, CD133, 24, 44, et cetera, also showing that there's a higher percentage of those sort of positive cells in the distal end of the tube. Um, so our work hasn't sort of directly targeted that, um, but I think that they're suggested there's something going on there. The flip side of that is that uh, Yi Meng, she and Bob Kerman recently published a paper that argues that ALDH is not a precursor marker for these lesions because it's lost in the stick lesion as they look through evolution. So I think there's definitely some component there. Exactly where is it? Is it the tubal junction or not? I, and I'd love to ask a comment. I think the hilum is the same thing. It, do we think that that's a similar area? You mentioned that something about that. Uh, yeah, so b basically we obviously need to uh, realize um, limitations of mouse uh, as a human equivalent. Um, in the mouse, uh, you have ovary uh, surrounded by ovarian bursa, and uh, basically end of uterine tube. Uh, some people call it oviduct, and some people fallopian tube. But basically it's uterine tube coming directly to the ovary, and there is a physical contact between ovarian surface epithelium and tubal epithelium plus mesothelium. So in the mouse, everything coming together. In humans, uh, during embryonic development, uh, this link between tubal epithelium and ovarian surface epithelium is largely finished. Basically, it's uh, present during embryonic development later. It is two separate structures. And uh, what you may have, instead of one junction area as in the mouse, you may have two junction areas. One is between ovarian surface epithelium and uh, mesothelium, and the other one between mesothelium and tubal epithelium. And so um, there are, um, actually part of this already published, there are indications that uh, it uh, can be two different uh, stem cell pools in the human. Uh, one is uh, in the hilum area 
on the side of ovary and other one is on the side of um, uh, fallopian tube. And so uh, this is kind of useful to keep in mind. So I actually agree with uh, Ronnie. Maybe it is finally come to very, very, um, um, you know, um, uh, single conclusion that there is this cancer-susceptible stem cell niche, which may be located, I agree, I mean, on this uh, junction area between tubal epithelium and metathelium. But I wouldn't completely discard the other possibility because what really happened, P53, besides of all of these known uh, properties, related to DNA damage, uh, related to apoptosis control, proliferation, and so on, it also has ability to move. So uh, basically, P53 is important for motile functions of ovarian surface epithelium. Uh, it, it has been uh, well demonstrated, we ourselves published, that if you inactivate P53, cells start to migrate much, much faster without any additional genetic alterations. It's basically primary cell function. And so you may imagine that if you have an activation of P53 in stem cells, which have particularly high level of MET receptor tyrosine kinase, which is one of the downstream targets of P53, you may expect that these cells start to migrate without being transformed. And then the question, where do they migrate? Do they migrate around ovary? Do they go to the uh, peritoneal cavity? Do they really migrate to fallopian tube and so on? So it is a little bit more complex than simply to say CPAX8 expression, and so everything coming from tubal secretory cells. Okay, uh, Bob, I think you had a question, and then Jerry. Um, so this is coming from an epidemiologist. Okay. Um, I always uh, wonder, uh, when I'm thinking about impact of uh, large association studies, um, how to answer these kind of questions, and I wondered what you thought. So you, you mentioned that you need maybe 40,000 cases to find these more common low penetrance SNPs. Um, and I'm thinking that there are, you know, only 20,000 new cases uh, of ovarian, ovarian cancers a year in the United States. So, uh, but I have trouble putting those together, and I wonder if there's any quantitative methods that... Um, you uh, know about or what your thoughts are on uh, assessing the, the impact of uh, low penetrance genes on uh, preventing ovarian cancer sometime in the future? So um, in terms of discovery, I guess your question is, are we ever going to get um, to the sorts of numbers where we can find everything? And the answer to that is, is no, I don't think we will. Uh, I mentioned in my talk that um, statisticians have become very valuable uh, and functional based statisticians. And so we're now seeing, with I think a lot of this work in different subtypes, uh, linking together uh, of different pathways for different ovarian cancer subtypes. And so I feel that there is a, a very strong role in the functional evaluation of a lot of these susceptibility alleles. And, uh, there is already data coming out for other cancers as well as ovarian cancer that you start not to look for, you know, 20,000 different molecular markers, but you start to look for the links between multiple markers within, different, within certain pathways. So I feel that a lot of uh, additional identification will come from a combination of genetics, epidemiology, and functional follow-up and looping back around when you find functional links. Um, and to give you some examples... Uh, we've started to you know, profile the uh, effects of deleting uh, some of these susceptibility alleles. And what you find is that there are certain pathways that seem to be strongly associated. And then when you look at those pathways where they are, transcription factors, you can then start to associate more subgenome-wide significant hits to um, those susceptibility alleles. Um, there's going to be an awful lot of development, I think, in this area to get to a point where we can use that information with confidence. So we can actually say that um, when we have a thousand genetic markers based on all of these bioinformatic approaches as well as the genetic epidemiology, that that actually is going to have an impact. But you know, we're also working with um, risk modelers who are utilizing this information to see how this affects, in a segregation analysis, um, the combined effects of these, these polygenic markers on a patient's risk. And uh, it's really about getting rid of as much of the noise as possible and trying to leave behind the signal which is useful. So I feel that's where a lot of the science will, will go. 
um, as we start to understand more the etiology, the biology associated with these alleles. Is this something that can be done now in terms of work, quantitative work, or is it something that must await more discovery uh, in terms of uh, SNPs and other alleles? I think it is something that is happening now. I think that it's a huge challenge. I think that um, we don't really know what these SNPs do. We, we hypothesize, but I know there are many groups out there, investigators, that are, are taking big leaps. You know, every, every year there are, there are additional stories that are coming out on how these non-coding alleles are actually causing disease. And I think it's really reassuring that you start to see, for example, with the more moderate risk genes, how they do cluster together in pathways. And I think that the technology that will enable us um, to start to do this, certainly in high-grade cirrus, to, to start to focus on what we feel are the most important candidate genes. Less so, I think, say, clear cell mucinous, but again, consortium studies have done very, very well of late in gathering together pretty large numbers of, say, mucinous cases, and I think that um, uh, one of the genetic papers that's about to come out describes for the first time specific um, susceptibility markers for, for, for mucinous ovarian cancer. We already know that there are specific markers for clear cell ovarian cancer. So I think there's a combination there of better stratification as well as more intense genetics, epidemiology, and function, all combining. Jerry and then Kathy. Um, just a couple of comments. You know, I, having grown up as a reproductive endocrinologist back in the pre-IVF days, we spent a lot of time studying the fallopian tubes so that we could understand what the environment for fertilization was and then try to transfer that knowledge into, uh, into the laboratory. So there's a wealth of literature out there in the late uh, 1970s uh, through the uh, early 1990s that addresses much of the biology of the tubal epithelium that is very relevant, including responses to steroids hormones, uh, 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 inflammatory factors, and the unique secretory uh, menu of mucosal uh, tissue of the, um, uh, of the tube, including proteins that are only found in the tube, ov oviductin, for example. So it's, it's interesting that, that that literature has been, to my way of of, of thinking relatively dormant in the thinking on, on the transition for ovarian, uh, uh, to ovarian cancer. And there's beautiful physiology that's been documented uh, by uh, Richard Blandow, who uh, observed human ovulation and also ovulation in, uh, in, the, in the rhesus macaque, where you see the fimbria uh, of the tube just like a vacuum cleaner over the ovarian surface in the periovulatory period which would undoubtedly create an opportunity for transfer of tubal epithelial cells to the ovarian surface. And I certainly hope that that literature can be rediscovered because I think there's a lot of relevant biology there. Yeah, I'll just comment. I mean, uh, when we were trying to come up with model systems to do this, we scoured the literature and found a lot of that. And I found it fascinating how the tube, you know, there was one study, I think, in sheep or in, in news where they showed that the fimbria can actually sort of track to the dominant follicle and sit right over the dominant follicle at the time of ovulation. Uh, and a lot of beautiful work looking at the physiology, as you said. In fact, that's what motivated us to develop some of these model systems because there was already so much known about that mucosa. Can I just follow up on that point? I'm, I'm oh. so Go ahead, Beth. I'm, I'm sorry, Kat. Just So getting back to the sink and the soil, so some of these changes in P53 signatures are more common in younger tubes. Yet we see most of our epithelial ovarian cancers outside of the BRCA folks, of course, in postmenopausal women. So how do you account for this delay? We see P53 signatures in 30-year-olds, and it's not for another 25 years, perhaps, that we actually see it fully develop into a, a transformed serous carcinoma. Yeah, I think that um, you know, the reality is that the, the incidence of stick lesion development is as rare as the incidence of getting ovarian cancer. So to me, that says that the checkpoints that restrain those cells are extremely robust um, in normal women. Uh, you look at some of the work that uh, like Joan Brugge did. She showed a beautiful study in breast epithelium, but I think the principle is the same, where she showed that if you take her 3D culture system where it forms hollowed out spheres, right, in anchored sort of independent conditions using MCF10A cells, and introduce one cell that has an oncogene driving it and ask which oncogenes are able to sort of 
break through the constraints of that epithelial polarity, right, very few are able to do it because there is an epithelial restraint, right, that is, is a architectural checkpoint as a, in addition to the genetic checkpoints. And that reminded me a lot of what we see with these signatures in the fallopian tube, that it's a stretch of cells that are normal looking, that are still polar, and I think the polarity of that epithelium constrains that as well, in addition to the genetic checkpoints, the DNA repair that's intact. And so I think you see these signatures because of, as we're talking, some thing related to ovulation that is common enough to cause them to occur, but most of the time they don't amount to anything, which is exactly what you think of a precancer or precursor to, to be. So this would be for um, Ronnie and or Alex, um, and it follows a little bit on, on Jerry's comment. So, so one of the things you describe, Ronnie, is that when we actually have the tubes to look at very carefully, in about a third of the time, we can't find a precursor that could account for what we're seeing out elsewhere in the pelvis. Um, and I guess one question I have is, given how well accepted it is that the ovarian clear cell and endometrioid cancers are so tightly associated with endometriosis and ectopic mullerian tissue, um, what are your thoughts on, say, endosalpingiosis as a potential site of origin for the non-tubal high-grade serous carcinomas? And you know. I think it's, it's an incredibly exciting, interesting area to look at because one of the worries that I have with the idea of salpingectomy only as a risk reduction is that you just don't know when those cells might have left, right? We, we know there's literature in BRCA mutation carriers that they have more cortical inclusion cysts, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's either tubal metaplasia or just simple endosalpingiosis of mullerian epithelium to the ovarian stroma. If those cells leave early, um, then salpingectomy doesn't prevent this from happening, right? Especially if they already left with some alterations, like a signature or some other thing. And now in the environment of the hormonally active ovarian stroma, that may be sort of a, a great place for these things to grow. So I think it's a great point um, that we have to be very careful of in thinking about what are the implications of this for risk reduction, because there's that issue. And then, of course, is the issue that ovary, it's, removing the ovary itself is very protective for breast cancer. So um, when thinking about this, you know, you have to be very careful. And I also think if you ever did something like that, you'd have to think of a two-step type risk reduction where you take out the tube prior to completion of uh, you know, reproductive years and then go back and grab that ovary at the time of men you know, men uh, menopause just to be sure you got everything. Because I think you know, your model is going to answer this, I think, because it's a great model to, to look at labeled cells and how early or what propensity are there for these cells to now shed to the peritoneum or the ovarian surface epithelium, right? So I think that that's a great point. All right. A little bit about genetics end of it, and a couple of questions, some related. Um, what are the implications of the, the panel testing sort of, I'm saying movement, it's not clearly not a movement, but what are the implications there, particularly in how it's communicated and how it will be understood? And um, I'll ask the other question afterwards, which relates to the same thing. It's very, it's very dangerous, in, in my opinion, I think. Um, without proper validation of candidate genes, I think that it's um, clearly going to be an issue down the road where it's going to be easier to give a patient a clinical test, you know, how technologies mean that we can do this, um, than it is to actually show whether that clinical test is important or not. Um, I think that there are, have got to be big discussions within the clinical genetics community about not just panel testing, but also SNP tests. I mean, you can buy SNP tests these days, and they are literally meaningless, um, many of them. So I think that this has to be driven by the research community working very closely with the clinical genetics community. Um, it wasn't so bad when BRCA1 and BRCA2 came out because it was clear that they were familial ovarian cancer genes. But when you're talking about population-based genetics where it's much less clear that something is causing a family history, then it becomes a real, real issue. Um, so I think that the, uh, the hurry-up of uh, clinical research community coming together uh, to address this issue is really important. And I know from meetings I've been to that um, there are patients who have, for example, an NBN truncating mutation found on these panel tests that uh, then has been used to advise that woman to have uh, surgical removal of their ovaries. And when you do the study, it's not important. 
gets exactly to the point that I, the, the question I had. And the other question that's related to genetics and so on is, is how do we um, make sure that the lifestyle factors are also incorporated into the risk fact into the risk equation when you risk assessment? And um, along with that, do we know or are we trying to figure out whether there's certain combinations of lifestyle and genetic factors that put you at greater or lesser risk and how are we communicating? For, for ovarian cancer, I think that, well, first of all, all, I want to compliment the epidemiologists who, just as the geneticists are doing, are taking very big combined studies to really find what those risk factors are. For ovarian cancer, there are going to be um, some risk factors which are quite minor, but they do have an effect. Um, I think that there are clearly well-known, well-defined lifestyle um, and epidemiological risk factors for ovarian cancer. So they could be incorporated into genetic risk models, I think, almost immediately, because we know enough about them. Um, I think there will also be, this is very much an open field, because there will also be interactions. We are not very good right now of being able to define a gene-environment interaction. Um, but again, with the improved biology, I feel that we will have an opportunity to look at some of the biological events that are taking place as, uh, as a result of abrogating some of these genetic factors, and they will lead to um, hints, clues, as to whether estrogen, for example, has an effect on this proportion of the, the genetic risk population, and, and uh, so it will proceed like that. But it's, it's a challenge, and I think that it's, it's going to be a long time before we really get that. But I feel the important thing here is to try to make sure that we get this information, good, robust information, into a clinical setting as soon as possible, and then let it evolve as bigger and bigger, better studies take place. So we have about five minutes left in the session for questions. I just want to remind the speakers that you all were asked to submit a two-page summary of your comments on the topics you talked about. Those are going to be critical for us to incorporate into the report. So if you could please um, get those to us the next week or so. If you haven't already, that's greatly appreciated. Uh, we will have a 20-minute break. So if we don't get to everyone's questions, the speakers will stay around for the break. If the speakers stay around for lunchtime, another opportunity for questions. I'd like to ask Simon um, one question. Um, you showed on your odds ratios that things like BRIP1 and RAD51 C and D have around a tenfold odds ratio, BRC2 seventeenfold. Um, if you put those genes together, you might get to around three percent of the population, which is not insignificant. So, for those genes, would that be enough today to say if you have BRIP1, you're a tenfold increased risk? Many of us will think that is clinically actionable, particularly when you show the MMR data, which we're acting upon, maybe erroneously, which is 2.3. So I think there'll be different opinions in the um, genetic and clinical community about this. Um, and I think that for things like that, um, it won't necessarily be a single decision. It's a very gray area, isn't it? Some people think that you should take action at a 5% um, risk. Some people think you should wait until it's 10%. Again, I think it'd be good if the clinical community could come together and uh, decide what they feel is the appropriate level of risk before you take action like that. Again, there'll be patients who say, well, I'm at a five-fold increased risk. I don't care what you say. I want surgery. My insurance company has done this testing. So I think that's also uh, a key issue. I think something like BRIP1 will be used as actionable. People will have their ovaries removed because they have a BRIP1 mutation. Um, and I think that we need to understand a lot more. So I've, I've put those figures up, not knowing what all the missense variants in BRIP1 do, for example. So I think also we have to bear in mind those risks might change over time as functional work starts to establish whether these mutations in this gene really are pathogenic or uh, an intermediate risk or truly high risk. So I think there's, there's also issues like that which will be important to introduce into the clinical genetic arena. Right. I mean, as we do more testing, just like for BRCA, we'll get to learn which variants are going to be significant and which ones you know, are not, co-segregation studies and those other that, sorts of things. Yeah, that's right. I think that's going to be critical. Okay. Heidi, you had a question? My question, My question was very similar Excellent. to Mary's, and I appreciate Simon's response. Really? I like your, um, your, how you refer to architectural restraint. Um, there's a, another type of restraint, and that is immunologic restraint. And um, especially based on the cancer immune surveillance hypothesis, so what do you think is going on? Why do some women reject um, tumor at that early stage where you have the stick lesions and, and so on and so forth, and others do not? Do we know um, the immune landscape um, of those very early lesions, number one? 
Number two, are we beginning to identify targets of immune recognition at that stage for potential therapies? That's a great question. Um, I, the, the short answer is that it's, it's work in progress, so there's really not much published literature there, uh, in part because we just haven't had the models to really look at that carefully. So um, I know, for instance, that uh, George Kukos and Dan Powell, who have been working in the immunology side, have been starting to look at this, uh, trying to compare, for instance, what is the immune landscape of normal benign epithelium in BRCA mutation carriers versus normal population, uh, looking at what the landscape looks like in stick lesions versus these other precursors or advanced disease. Um, I don't think we have a good handle on that yet, but clearly I think, you know, immunosurveillance is probably going to play a big role because one of, the, you know, one of the, the questions that comes up, and I didn't have time to talk about this, um, but, you know, people like Liz Swisher and others have suggested that maybe we shouldn't call these stick, right? Why? Because we're saying it's a carcinoma, but we don't really know whether every stick has the ability to progress to an invasive cancer. So maybe we should call them TIN for tubal intraepithelial neoplasm, right? Otherwise unspecified. Uh, and I think it comes to your point, which is that maybe th there are some of them that are constrained because of all these checkpoints, including immune surveillance, and others that are not. And it could be related to SNPs, and it could be related to a variety of other things that are unique to each patient. But not every stick maybe has the potential to advance. And I think we have to keep that in mind because there certainly haven't been enough studies, either genetically or even epigenetically, on sticks to know whether they're all same, same, right? And I think it's to your point. I think the models we have now, you know, the mouse models that exist now will give us an opportunity to start looking at that. I think that we have an opportunity to look at some of these, you know, at the, at the human tissue level, some of these using, you know, single cell isolation and so on. But I don't think that, I think the verdict's out. I think there's a lot more left to figure out. Thank you, Simon. 20 second response. <laughs> I don't have a response, but I just want to say that um, one thing that we need to consider is how all this novel uh, early stage mechanisms, uh, the modeling, could be used for better detection of markers that could be used for screening. It's something that is a little bit off the radar because we know CA125 doesn't work particularly well and ultrasound doesn't work particularly well, but this, I think, presents a great opportunity to start to develop from these models better markers for ovarian cancer screening. Did you have one last burning question? And so we're now we should go to our 20-minute break. Is that correct? Yeah, we'll take a 20-minute break. Um, for, for people in the public, there is a cafeteria on the third floor if you want to get a snack or coffee. Um, and knowing my chair, we will start exactly at 10.50. <laughs> <laughs>